Dreadnoughts are a funny thing in some ways. They really are. And, well, I have cheated with this a little bit, this video. I will admit, I have cheated a tad. And by cheating, what I mean I have done is that the slides are not new slides. The slides are not. Why? Because I did an entire series called Dreadnoughts 1905 to 1914. It was a great series. I loved doing it. And I produced some really friggin' good slides for it. And I'm an academic. I have no qualms about reusing slides and talking about something else from them if they work. If they don't work, I'll put in new slides. But if they will work, I reuse the slides. And if you want to go see how these slides were used originally, you can go and find the Dreadnought 1905-1914 series, which actually <coughs> spends more, goes from 14 to about 16, more than like anything. Shame's book plug. But no, um, new slides didn't seem to be necessary because I had all these wonderful slides. And because what was I going to do? I was going to talk about the Dreadnought battleship and how it came to be. And what it became before World War One. And that's an interesting one. That's a scenario because what we're talking about is the slow evolution of ships from having a mixed armament to what we would call would be a very simplified armament. Now, please note I'm not saying an unmixed armament. I'm not. You will. You normally hear people talk about, well, they have a uniform main battery. They do. They still have a secondary battery. It's usually rapid-firing guns, which are designed to destroy destroyers and torpedo boats and those sort of things, which are small things that fry, which can attack them with torpedoes. But they still have them. But unlike the pre dreadnoughts they don't have these sort of mixed heavy batteries where you have this heavy gun, this heavy gun... And then, you know, so 12-inch guns at each of their end, and then 9.2-inch guns in the middle. You don't have that. That's a pre-dreadnought thing. The other standard we usually try and use is turbine-powered, but there are some American and some German dreadnoughts, which are undoubtedly dreadnought battleships in their shape and form, which do not have turbine power, because... Well, in the nicest way, with America, it was always more a case of less their capability to do turbines and more their Congress's inability to not uh, also give some money to another company which couldn't make turbines. So they had to have triple expansion engines. And I'm sorry, people who think it's new with Congress, it really isn't. It's not new in any political class, trust me. There are some fun stuff in Britain. Okay, the, the, there's fun stuff in France. You, you can go through pretty much any democracy. It's reached the point it's a feature, not a bug. Um, because sometimes that does have unintendedly better consequences. If you're talking about the American triple expansion engines, well, with their ships, it gives them a reliability and range, which means they can deploy them around the world and maintain them a lot easier than they can their turbine ones, where they have to get spare parts, source spare parts from far more difficult to get places. Turbines are far more specialist than a triple expansion engine at the time when they're being produced. So there is actually advantages to it. It wasn't intended as an advantage, but it is an advantage. <sighs> These are some of the people involved. Some of the people involved. And there, I've left out some. I've left out Admiral Tegadoff, because Tegadoff's victory at least there is what makes Jackie Fisher decide that HMS Dreadnought has to have six forward-firing guns, which is why she ends up with wing turrets. And it's also because he doesn't believe it's technologically possible that he does, so he doesn't get her to have super firing guns, whereas others already have super firing guns being designed, but he thinks it's technologically impractical. But the interesting person that we usually talk about is Vittorio Cunaberti, because Cunaberti is this Italian who has the great ideas for these ships. And the idea is you have a uniform main battery. And the reason you have a uniform main battery is that allows you uniform theoretical range and targeting. So it makes it easier to control and fire at range. And you launch fire a salvo of shells at range, at a target range, and from the salvo you will probably get a certain number of hits. 
I know in World of Warships you'll get very, very happy if you're playing that game and you get all your shells to hit the target. In real life, that never happened. Okay? I even find Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts and some of the other games to be kind of interesting. They are kind of interesting because you have almost a far higher likelihood of getting a multi-round salvo hit than you do in real life. In real life, you'd fire twelve shells. You, if it, if the shell, if that salvo actually made contact, the odds are one. Occasionally, two shells would actually hit the target. But that was the reason why they had the uniform main battery. That was the reason why they had all the fire control systems they had because. They could now take advantage of firing at range. If we go back again to here before we get into the first range, uh, first you know, first uh, generation, Admiral Toko uh, Togo Hayachiro, his battle at Toshima, where he had used long range fire from multiple ships, that had shown a way. That had shown what was possible. That had shown the fact that it was possible to do this. And that has an impact. But the fact is, a lot of these things were already going that way before Toshima confirmed it. It's kind of like the Battle Lisa confirmed armoured ships were really a lot, lot better option than unarmoured ships in a battle, and he really didn't want to be in an armoured ship. Armored unarmed and ship in a battle. Well, the Battle of Tsushima confirms, when it's already heading that way, that big gun artillery, long range battles are coming. But that's also another reason why Kinoberti's idea is all around triple expansion engines. You can tell that because of the final layout. Whereas, Dreadnought. It's built around turbines. Now, why does that come into? Where does that come into? Well, it's a very simple scenario, really. When you're dealing with the scenario you're dealing with in terms of ship design, if you want to have an artillery engagement at range, you need to have the speed to dictate the range. And you need to be able to maintain that speed. And the thing about turbines is for pound for pound, they can give you more power than triple expansion. At this period, at this level of technology. Things if it's about, but uh, as a rule, that's what comes in. And so... The turbines are selected. They can give you that power, they can give you that speed. And they can allow your battleship to go 21 knots, when everyone else in the world can do 18. And 3 knots. A 3 knot advantage is what you need to give you the ability to decide events. Now remember that when we're talking about other ships in this series. When we get on to the battle cruisers and battleships in July, Because three knots gives you the advantage to decide speed, to decide range, to decide what you're engaging at. And that matters because you can therefore, hopefully, if you get it right, dictate the engagement so you're engaging at the range which is most suited for your guns and least suited for their guns. Now, the thing about a dreadnought that I really want to get across to people is at no point are any of them ever armoured that they are going to be impervious to their own guns or anyone else's guns. They're not impervious. What they are armoured to is to be able to withstand the initial blow of hopefully equivalent guns. Initial blow. At a certain range. 
Okay. Usually at ranges of their ideal engagement range or greater. Slightly less, but sort of within the band around that ideal engagement range. So you can tell what a battleship's ideal engagement range and what it's being designed for by the level it's armoured to. That tells you something. Now, if you get closer, well, you are not going to be surproof. If you get more distant, you're going to be safer. So, the armour is armoured to the level at which they can receive an equivalent hit at their ideal engagement range, and the first round that hits won't get through. But be careful, because the second, if it hit a round that hits that area, that will get through. You have, at that point, to rely on your own internal subdivision and your orga internal organization. So if you build a ship with thicker armor, the odds are, and it's got the same guns as the counterpart, or similar guns, with similar profiles, the odds are you're building it to fight at closer ranges than your counterpart is. It's as simple as that. So next time you're evaluating an armor belt and you're going, well, you know, top trumps, there's a reason behind those figures. There is a thinking and a thought process going on behind those figures. And it's worthwhile understanding. For the US Navy, especially, Dreadnoughts represented quite an unabashed opportunity, far more than they did for Germany. Uh, one of the things that had been going on with the build-up of their navy was that they could never quite catch up to the British numbers of battleships. Because the British could build more. The British had built more. The British had built larger classes than anyone else. As we covered in the pre dreadnought video, you know, or as I call them, the Royal Sovereigns video, as I divide up my vessels in that period far differently than just calling them all pre dreadnoughts. Because whilst they are before the dreadnought, some of them actually come after the dreadnought. And they didn't know the dreadnought was coming. So at no point was anyone going, I'm building a pre dreadnought. No. But people were saying, I'm building a sovereign starship. Or I'm building a steam battleship. So for the Americans, who actually can develop the industry and infrastructure to build a necessary fleet, it does represent a massive opportunity to Dreadnought's appearance to grow. I would say for the Germans, it represents a trap. Because theoretically they can go, well, you know, now we're all equal, we're now down to one. They haven't got the industry. They haven't got the infrastructure behind the industry to really churn that out and turn it into advantage. Unless they want to gut their army. And... You're not going to gut the army. You're not. At no point are you going to gut the army in Germany. It's just not going to happen, and politically it's never going to happen. But then we go with the Dreadnoughts, you do get a Dreadnought race. You've already been having a bit of a naval race going on. Please note this again, there's been a bit of a naval race going on for about the last... By this point, you'll be sorting, talking about since about 1895. Yes, there were talks about it earlier. Yes, you can. Some people can date it back and go, it was 1886. But people talking about a race, uh, talking about a race, and talking about building in competition with people does not make a race. When they actually start building, that's when it becomes a race. Okay, up until that point, it's hot air. It really is. So, you already have a bit of a race going on. That's one of the reasons why Dreadnought is built. But I'd also argue Dreadnought herself is built as part of the tech race because. One of the things you have to understand is that Germany is always content 
when it's racing against Britain to just build at the level it needs to. Because they can't get the funding, because they can't compete with the army for funding, they don't want. They want to get to a level and be able to churn out. They don't want to have to keep pushing up. The people who are pushing up, and one of the reasons behind Dreadnought herself coming about, are the Italians, who are, of course, in, in, really encouraged by Cunaberti's ideas, and the Americans, who, let's be honest, at no point in their history have ever heard the phrase we want to put on a lot of big guns on a ship and not gone hello you want to put a lot of big guns on a ship we're listening attentively and the Royal Navy does like to push forward technology they always liked it. they always remember the warrior moment when they basically silenced the Franco fret uh, the French fret in one go by just going, you've built the Gloire, cute. Uh, we've churned out these two vessels, the wa Warrior and Black Prince, and they are better than... They are both better in every single way than the Gloire, and we didn't put any effort into it at all. Next move, yours. So they always remember that. But the thing was, they built two. They built two. HMS Dreadnought is built on our own. So it can't be really a Warrior Black Prince moment, because it's not, it's a one-off ship. It's an experimental ship, it can be argued. People can say, oh, well, the British could only build one. Well, the British could build a lot, and the British did build a lot. They built more than anyone else, actually. But... Putting down a statement of one is just setting a standard. It's not making a statement, sadly, for everyone involved, including Admiral Jackie Fisher, who should have known that, and definitely for the politicians who should have listened to that. So it starts off this wonderful race, this wonderful development. And you'll notice I've designed and divided up the slides, although I've used the same slides, into roughly three generations. We've got the first generation, which are the ones which are response mainly to Drenot herself. And there's the second generation, which are response to mainly the Orions. The Royal Navy pushing up. Why? Because they know the Italians, they know the Americans, they know everyone. There are no lots of powers are looking at moving up, and the British want to jump first. Because the British have now set a standard whereby they have Technological, and they are maintaining technological and numerical superiority. Second generation. And that's a problem, really. If you are focused on maintaining technological and numerical superiority, because it's expensive. It's not as expensive as war. And in Britain's case, it's not as expensive as you might assume, due to the sheer quantity of maritime industry, a lot of the development costs are being, how do I put this, met by private industry, putting in the initial investment, and met by private industry selling both to Britain, but also to Italy and Japan. When I talk about the tech race on Dronauts, and I always consider the tech race almost more interesting than the numerical race, because... The quantity versus quality race. You know, the the race against Germany is always a, qu a quantity race. It's always numbers. It's always that's always all Tuppet thinks about is numbers, 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 numbers. And he never really thinks about how can we truly deploy the strength of Germany. But when you consider that I, in the technology race, I include four powers. America. Britain, Japan, and Italy. All four of those powers buy, uh, buy turbines from the same person at certain points. Uh, if I put them down. Yeah, Britain. I sh really should have done with Britain as the first finger, shouldn't I? That would be far less complicated. <laughs> All four 
buy other systems from Britain. Britain is selling them. Pretty much, Britain is therefore providing technology behind the race it itself is participating in for many of the other com uh, other nations. Why? That's surely stupid. No, it's not. Because with all these four nations, with Britain at least, there's a bit of there's always a bit of an issue in terms of the Japanese America relationship, but between the four of them with Britain, there is a good relationship. And Britain's happy happy to sell them technology because it generates income. But it also has a few other advantages for Britain. Because, think about it, they buy turbines off you. They buy the spare parts for those turbines off you. Instead of developing their own turbine industry and developing their own industry, building these things, that industry is delayed by having to compete with your mature and viable industry. Oh, and please note, Germany also buys Parsons turbines, or pretty much their battle cruisers, up until you get to the Macklesons. Pretty much all their turbines are raw are Parsons made in Britain. Why? Why is Britain selling the turbines? Surely Britain's going. Hang on, we could stop your construction by just stopping selling you the turbines. Because for Britain, the advantage lies, and you see this in World War One. The advantage lies in the fact that. Yeah, you've bought this piece of high technology from us instead of building your own. And yes, you have, at the same time, developed your own industry, and they have got their own turbine construction going by World War One, and they have got some ships with German-made turbines in them. But uh, now you have a choice. You either have to use very precious, uh, sp a very, very limited access to spare parts to keep those vessels going, or you have to take them out of service, rip open their armor and replace their turbines with your own industri uh, own turbines. Either which is going to take time. Either one is going to limit your... Uh, the first one option is going to limit your operations. The second one is going to mean you can't do operations for months on end. Oh, and by the way, the yards which are doing that work and the infrastructure and industry you're putting into that work means you can't build any new ships while we're building new ones. It's not a complicated idea. It's a very simple and very basic idea, but it works. As the dreadnoughts develop, as they get more and more powerful, different factors start to appear in their design. And some really interesting ideas start to appear. There are some ships which are, if we consider the previous class, the Wyomings. They're draggers. And what do I mean by draggers? Well, if you think about that, they have 12 inch 12 guns in six twin turrets. Two of those turrets are forward. Four of those turrets are aft. So they are dragging their firepower into battle. They are a broadside engagement waiting to happen. You do not want to be in a stern chase against a Wyoming. Although if you are in a stern chase, they can only go roughly 20 and a half knots, so, you know, it won't be too difficult. HRS Dreadnought could catch them. And now we have our other decision being made. What speed do you go for with your battle line? And just because you can build faster, is it sensible to build faster? Because if you're trying to organize a battle line of ships, you want them to have a similar operating... Well, as similar operating statistics as possible to make it as easy as possible to operate together. If all the ships have 
a different top speed, a different cruising speed, a different turning circle. If all of them have different stats for all these different things, that is going to make your life very, very complicated as an admiral, as a fleet, as captains on those ships, as crews on those ships, because operating together is going to be a nightmare. And this is a lesson navies have learnt in the steam battleship period, since from the ironclad frigates onwards, steam battleships, and then into the Royal Sovereign, the Sovereign's period, Sovereign Battleship period. They have learnt this lesson over and over again when they have tried to produce battle fleets of differing performance sch schematics, different performing statistics. And this is one of the reasons why the Americans, pursue, uh, Americans pursued a standard battle line. They can build ships which are faster. They can build ships which are more capable. But... If they build ships which are all roughly accordance with each other in the standard battle line, it will be a far stronger overall force. The very real point here is that the cumulative value can be greater than the sum of the parts. If you get the design right. If you get the thought process right. You also have some interesting things in that I've said this before, and it's going to be. There is actually a very specific video about this coming out. The Austrians, the Austro-Hungarians, produced some of the most technically advanced dreadnoughts built in World War One, and built in server. This is the Tegetov class. Okay, these are some of the best designs of dreadnoughts anywhere. If you want to go and study a really neat, the Tegetov is a good class to go look at. The other point I have to make about them is they are building these and they are a lot better than their equivalent German construction at the same time. And yet they get forgotten. But what it should be remembered is that this class of ships keeps the entire Italian Navy, most of the French Navy, and the sections of the Royal Navy busy throughout World War I, watching for their movements. Worrying about their movements. Because they are that powerful. And they are that capable. As I've said repeatedly on the subject of aircraft carriers, and it's the same as dreadnoughts, the same is true on destroyers, frigates, every single ship you can design as a nation, every single ship that serves you. It doesn't matter how its stats stack up against another nation's equivalent. What matters is how its stats stack up against your needs. What you need that ship to do. Top Trump's is fun. Top Trump's history is... It's it's a fun, easy way to learn the stats. It's a you can get playing cards and all sorts of things that you can with warships that you can sit there and you can learn the stats in a really good way to get especially younger kids involved. But war doesn't work like that. War is not top trumps. History is not top trumps. A ship which is a perfect design, the perfect, insert whatever type of ship you want here, for one nation, would be an absolutely terrible ship for another. And the reason for it can be apparently very strange. The example I currently give when I'm talking to, uh, to um, students, when I do some, some of the lectures I give, Arleigh Burke class. I asked the students, what's the most powerful destroyer in the world? And usually they name a very special Korean vessel. And I know, okay, so what's the most powerful destroyer that most people in the world are going to see? They named the Arleigh Burke. Then I asked them, would your Navy like to have an Arleigh Burke? And the answer is almost always, nope. Why? It's incredibly crew-intensive. 
it requires a large crew for its size, and it's, how do I put this, it's designed to be very intensively maintained. And the thing is, for most small or medium navies, those requirements would cripple the navy from being able to do other things. So yes, it's a great ship. Yes, it's br uh, yes, it's brilliant. Yes, we have a lot of respect for it. Yes, it's capable. But at the same point, if you don't have the ability to support, if you uh, if you're supporting that and uh, supporting that ship is going to cripple the rest of your force uh, your force structure, you don't want it. The example in this whole grouping, and I think it was here, is the Espana class. Spain. They wanted a dreadnought. They wanted a dreadnought. But they didn't have the facilities, i.e. the dry docks, the infrastructure, to support a large ship. They wanted to build it themselves. They did, but basically they did it by buying a kit from the UK. That's what pretty much you've got. You've got Yarrow boilers, you've got Parsons steam turbines from memory. You've got pretty much... Uh, the, uh, the armour, I think, is also imported from the UK. Basically, it's import It's kind of like an IKEA furniture package. They import and they assemble. But it fits their needs. It has a complement of 854. If we go and look at this to Corvair class, that has a complement of 1,115. So, roughly 250, 200, well, 261 more. Now, what's that really equal? What does 260 equal? Well, let's go through it again with the stats you'd be talking about this period, because it's not quite like today. Today, you need slightly more people at home uh, because in this period you could get a how do I put this you could do a lot of your training at sea you could do a lot of your qualifications at sea you could do a lot of the admin at sea and also home life wasn't as big a factor in that there weren't as many options for jobs which would have paid equivalent money and allow them to stay at home. Plus, there weren't as many opportunities for travelling around the world as there are today. So, you know, you didn't have those advantages. So, you know, you had the ability to be able to get away with roughly... Mm, I would say for every crewman you have, you require for a ship, you probably, for every two, you probably need an extra person. Now you think about that, if you have it over four ships, 260, that's, so as the Spanish were originally planning four ships, that's an extra thousand, but you need an extra on that, that's an extra 1,500. So that's 1,500 more people. You need a navy, at least. If you start thinking of the extra infrastructure and support you need for those people, all the extra training, etc., all the extra admin stuff that's going to accrue, you're talking about at least 2,000 wages, and that's before you get on the feeding and all those things. That's a lot of people. Now, if you're a Navy like the Royal Navy at this point, and you can quite happily command tens of thousands of people, nearly hundreds, uh, nearly a hundred or so thousand people at certain points, that's a couple of percent. It's not really something you're going to worry about. If you're a smaller navy, let's say you've got 30,000, suddenly a couple of thousand people is a lot.
So it's a factor to think about. Pontedocal Vore class, a thousand crew. Thirty one officers and nine hundred and sixty nine enlisted crew. Take it off, one thousand eighty seven. So there is a sort of size here of what a full size dreadnought is roughly going to cost you in terms of crew. So Spain goes for the Espanias, which are not full sized. But it's a perfectly legitimate choice for them to make. The thing is, an Espania, what is its purpose to do? Well, during the Spanish-American War, Spain got humiliated. They don't have the money to rebuild. But they don't want to completely fall from status. They don't want to lose any more. And so the Hispanic class are about holding on to what they have. They're in many ways oceanic defense ship, a coastal defense ship. Their job is not to go out and fight as a battle line. Their job is to be a portable extra firepower that you can put in key places if you need to defend it. That can raise the cost. Because suddenly, instead of me sending some cruisers to beat up your squadron and take over the Philippines, I have to send my battle fleet because none of my cruisers are going to win against the Hispania class. Well, I can't guarantee they're going to win, and they probably won't. So that means I'm probably going to have to send my battle fleet, which is going to be expensive. So it raises the cost of me attacking you. It's a risk fleet. It's a deterrent. Now, yeah, the Rivadania class, the only dreadnoughts of the South American uh, race not built by the British company. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a, there is this whole race, a dreadnought race in South America, and if it wasn't for the Rivadania class, they would all have been built in Britain. Some of them would be built in the yards alongside each other. Literally, you're being built in that yard, and you can see the yard which is building the other one. The one from the competing nation. You can stare at each other. That's the South American Dreadnought Race. And it's very real. And it also has a very real impact on technology. Because at certain points, nations are looking at these ships being built and going, Britain is not building them for a foreign power. It's a cover. Or they cannot be building them for Australia. Uh, for, and they cannot be building them for Brazil or for... Um, well, even though we're even quite shocked about the British bill actually building a ship for Australia. But for Brazil or for Chile or for, you know, whoever they're building from, it must be for someone else. It must be for someone who's buying it through them as a proxy. Is it really for Russia? That was a very common one. Is it really for Russia? Now, of course, there's this vessel, which starts off as the Rio de Janeiro, being built for Brazil. Then becomes the Sultan Osman Erival for the Ottoman Empire. And then becomes Agincourt. Because the British decide that the Ottomans are far too close to the Germans. They are not getting a capital ship. Because the British have no intention of fighting a capital ship they built. At this point. Historically, they've actually fought against a lot of capital ships they've built. Good news, it usually means you have the schematics and you know exactly where the weak points are. Now, as time went on, the ships got more and more powerful. And there are two methods they seek to grow in power. One of them is to have more guns. The other one is to have bigger guns. Why? Why are you seeking more power? Well, usually it's being pursued, actually. Well, it's kind of interesting. The British tend to make the jump first, but they're making the jump before others do. They're kind of doing a warrior-to-gloire scenario. 
they're jumping when they know others are going to jump. And they are jumping so they get there first. But the others are jumping because the others are seeking a way to offset the numerical advantage the British are capable of producing. It's all about status. Even the technological, even the tech, the tech race is about status. Yeah, you have 20 odd battleships, but we have 8, and ours have bigger guns than yours. Yeah, we'll lose in a fight. But we'll lose in a fight costing you a lot. It's the basic rule of deterrence. It's always been the same. Smaller nations, as a rule, if they wanted to deter larger nations, have to spend money on... Well, small nations, they usually have less people, so they have to make sure the equipment they're in is individually a lot better so they can raise the cost of someone trying to bully or acquire them. You want to raise that cost. So that it's cheaper to make concessions at a negotiation table than it is to lose. But this is the point. Well, to lose ships but still win. This is the point. And this is the problem really for Tirpitz and the whole sort of quantitative race that Germany finds itself in thanks to Tirpitz and his obsession with the Royal Navy. And the Kaiser's obsession with having a massive navy. Tech races don't have a heat. Because if you have a tech race and you think about you having the quality you have the quality of the capability, it's always sort of e sort of evens out because it's a case of yeah, we have more, we have bigger guns, but we have more ships. You have bigger guns, we have more ships. So no one feels afraid. You think because you're bigger guns that you are secure because the cost of trying to do anything to you is going to be exorbitant. And we, because we have more ships, think we can do something if we need to, but we prefer not to because, frankly, the cost will be exorbitant. And that you can't do anything to us because we have more ships and the cost will be exorbitant because they will outnumber you and we'll win. As long as they're not a complete disparity in tech levels, a complete overwhelming disparity in tech levels, that's what you sort of get. You get a balance between the bigger and the medium powers. And it works. But if you start pushing and going, right, and what I want to do is I want to match you in numbers, I want to make your costs so large the cost so expensive for you to di disagree with me that you cannot disagree with me under any circumstances. That's the idea I'm pushing. Well, then that becomes a very dangerous race. That becomes a very different tone. A very different thought process. A very different analysis. And that's the difference. You can have the qualitative dreadnought race going on. And please, no one bring up France. It's not fair to them. Between Italy, Austria being, Austria-Hungary being good also runs, who occasionally top in these absolutely amazing designs and then go away. That's, how do I put this? They're like the kid at school, who most of the time is sitting quietly at the back of the class. You barely know they're there. And occasionally, though, when they feel like it, they'll raise their hand and they'll chuck in an answer so sublimely brilliant. They'll sit there and go, where did that come from? I thought you were asleep. Who are you? And then they go back again to their normal position and you sort of go, well, okay, it was one off. That is the Austro-Hungarians. The Japanese are slowly trying to push themselves up, and they're really the ones pushing towards what will become the fast battleship. Why? Because the Japanese don't have enough money and enough industry and enough people 
to be able to support both enough battle cruisers for doing the battle cruiser role they need them to do, and enough battleships to do the battleship role they need to do. And remember, the Japanese from the very beginning have been having this concept of having large cruisers, which could support the battle line. As I explained in very a few videos, those large cruisers are not supposed to beat other battleships. They're supposed to hold and damage the enemy battleships in place long enough that after they're sunk, your battleships, right, the remaining Japanese battleships, can roll up and sink those battleships they've been fighting after having sunk already their counterparts. That's the idea. In terms of if they're winning. If they're losing, basically their two have co caused the cost to be so great that the enemy has lost, instead of losing and being able to double up their battleships and wipe them out with minimal cost, they have lost a large number of their battleships. That's the idea for the Japanese. Well, for them, the fast battleship, which can do both, the, to an extent, do the battle cruiser role, but can also do the battle line role, is a natural confluence of that. And so they're pushing towards that. And you can see that in some of their designs, how their their first battle cruisers are battle cruisers one word. They're definitely that. And some of their other plans and designs and where they're going. That's what they're heading towards. They, they admit they're heading towards it. With the Americans, from the get-go, it's about having this powerful battle line. Why? Because they see naval power... Sorry, knocked over my mic. They see naval power, broadly speaking, as defensive. It's a very different approach than what you can think almost anyone else thinks. Because the Americans basically see the Atlantic and the Pacific as their moats. And they can keep the rest of the world on the other side of them. And they will keep the rest of the world on the other side of them. And yes, Philippines and all the other bases they have around the world, they're great for keeping the things on the other side of the oceans from them. And that's what their battle fleet is for. Yes, they are building... They're building Lexington-class battlecruisers by the end. And... Yes, those vessels are interesting, and I've done a whole video on them in key ships. And I'll leave that to one side. But the American battle line is being built as this solid formation. This solid. Ultimately, it's not fast, it doesn't need to be fast. Because you can't control the American coast, or say you control the American coastlines, until you defeated it. So it doesn't need to be fast. You need to come to it. So it can be heavily armoured, and it can slog it out of you. And cause a lot of damage while doing it. So the American battleships, they're focused on firepower, they're focused on armor. Speed? Eh, something that happens to other people. The German battle force is kind of similar to the Japanese. Although they would hate to admit that. Where their battle cruisers are being built in a way to back up their, armor, their battle, uh, battleships because... The fact they're never going to have enough. They very quickly realise they're never going to have enough. And so they need their battle cruisers to be there to take some of the punishment. To stop them being double-sided. Completely enveloped by a British fleet. The British are the more complicated battle line development once you get to the Dreadnoughts. They are really are, because... Starts off with them building more dreadnoughts. And then because others are jumping up the tech tree, they jump up the tech tree because they have to get there first, because that's the important thing for them. Please note again, they're jumping from 12 to 13 and a half. They're jumping an inch and a half in front, which gives them more options before you reach 18 inches. Where lots of people are already theorizing it's going to end up, right? So, for them, they calculated that's 12, 14, 16, 18. For everyone else. 12, 14, 16, 18. For the British, it goes 12, 13 and a half, 15, 16 and a half, 18. Gives them an extra step of increment going up. So they could moderate the escalation that much more. Yes, there are logistical reasons and there are gun design reasons for why they're going up an inch and a half, but there's also an advantage to it. In that, 
they realize others are going up in a tech race and they realize what they'll probably do is do two inch jumps. But if the British can minimize their jumps to inch and a half, which is the minimum that is a viable jump to make, going up a single inch doesn't really help in any way, shape or form. Doing that jumps in that style and that scenario, it gives them more flexibility to try and modulate that tech race to try and take some of the heat out of it so they can also deal with the quantitative race they have going on with Germany. This affects their battle line because whilst they have the 12-inch aeronauts, they then have the 13.5-inch ships, and then they have the 15-inch ships. And then in World War One, they also have 14-inch and gunships as well in terms of HMS Canada. Look, the Vickers salesmen have to get somewhere. All these ships... All these ships offer the British slightly different capabilities. Because if we even go back to this vessel, right? Theoretically. Theoretically, top speed, 24, 25 knots. In reality, sometimes different. If we go back to the Orions... All the way back to the Orions. All the way back. Their top speed was 21 knots. Theoretically. Again, they could do slightly faster. So the British are keeping things within roughly 3 knots. So basically, the Queen of Class are this great option which allows them to now dictate that battle line back to the battle line. They want to still be able... They don't want to go so fast that people are suddenly racing and jumping ahead to keep up. They want to go fast enough that they have the advantage that they can pick the distance of engagement, they can pick the type of the time of engagement, and they can pick how the engagement goes. They're looking for a commanding speed advantage, not a astonishing speed advantage. So again, we can have the conversations about what happens if the Queen Elizabeth class are built with small tube boilers and can go 28 knots. That is something the British could have done. The British have the technology sitting there. There are lots of small tube boiler development going on. They could have taken and added that risk into the, 50, into the Queen Elizabeth's. They could have also added triple turrets into them. So they could have had 12, 15 inch guns. And they could have had small tube boilers. They could have done all that. Infrastructure wise, they could have supported it. But, if the British suddenly have a 12, 15 inch gun, 28 knot vessel. And what's that going to do to the quantitative race? The British know this. Think about today when we're talking about weapons and the development of weapons in the modern period. You will more often hear flashy announcements coming from Russia and some other nations around the world will make flashy announcements about their weapons capabilities, about big demonstrations of them. Oh, we can do this, we can do that. Grandiose statements. The president, you know, Putin will get on the Thing, uh, get on the television and go, we can do this and this with our weapons. If you look at NATO, it doesn't tend to make the same level of statements. Why? Why does it not? Well, it comes back down to that whole deterrent factor. For those nations, it's important for them to say they have the biggest and the best because, to be honest, their ego requires they make that loud statement. Their national identity requires they make that loud statement because if they don't, then do they matter anymore? And if they don't matter anymore, then they have a bit of an identity crisis going on. This goes back to the Espania and all the other sh things I've been talking about in this scenario. 
What matters for NATO nations isn't shouting about whether they have the capabilities or not, it's actually having the capabilities that they need. And again, comes back to what is the ship which is best for you? The Queen Elizabeth class gives the Royal Navy a force of fast battleships which are part of the battle line which can dictate range and can force the enemy to change their position and manoeuvre in a fight because they have to respond to their movements. The Revenge class gives the Royal Navy a reinforced battle line of 21 knots which can pummel most opponents. And by having 8 rather than 12 15-inch guns, they haven't caused the Americans and other, the Italians who are relying on mostly their massive guns to provide an offset to the numbers of the British. They haven't caused them to be worried. By choosing what ground you compete on, what areas you compete in, you can modulate and have a decisive impact on such quantitative or qualitative races. And it's, it's the same with the modern statements. By choosing what grounds NATO makes statements on, America makes statements on, sort of the power, powers on one side of the debate make statements on, they can actually have an impact on what the other side is doing. They, they take the heat out of the competition. And they make it actually more difficult for the if you're in a quantitative race for the other side. If you're in a qualitative race, it makes it easier. It takes the heat out of it. You're still going to have the qualitative race. You're still going to be having that tech race. But it's not got the heat because you're not competing on everything. You have numbers and big guns. We have Numbers of ship, uh, numbers of big guns. It evens out. This is where this class would have been really interesting from the Italians, by the way, because originally planned to have 12 15 inch guns, they basically dropped it down to four, 15, uh, four twin turrets. Why? Because they wanted to maintain their speed, because they wanted to be able to use their existing infrastructure. And most importantly, because the Italians realized that if they went for a 12, 15 inch gun vessel with a top speed of 28 knots, they would cause the British to have to react. They would, which would cause everyone else to have to react. And their flagship would quickly be surpassed. Whereas they wanted to be in the conversation. They wanted to have a status vessel which was a status vessel for years to come. So. There we end. Dreadnoughts. An hour. The question of this, and the question of this entire video, and if you want to go hear the stats about the ships, please go to the 1905 to 1914 series Dreadnoughts on this channel. You will find it a very cool series, hopefully, and a link to the series should appear at the end. And you'll find all the stats on ships, and I talk them through year by year what's being built. But the question I want to ask, because I always finish videos on a question, is this. Pick a nation, pick a year, and think about what ship would best fit their needs. So let me first discount for you. Don't design the biggest, baddest ship you can possibly imagine. Because the odds are that doesn't fit any nation's needs. It doesn't. Because even if they can afford to build it, even if they can build and maintain it, 
they probably can't afford enough of them to do all the missions they need to do. They can't afford to be in the place they need to be. One of the problems for the Royal Navy is they need to theoretically provide battle squadrons for the Mediterranean, the Indian, Pacific, and possibly the Atlantic at the same time, potentially. That's one of the reasons why you don't see a mass scrapping of the sovereign sort of style of dreadnought, uh, sovereign style battleships, the moment the dreadnought comes into service, because the Royal Navy still needs to be in those places, and because those ships will do the job. That's it. So, pick a nation, any nation, pick a year in the dreadnought race, and decide what it needs, and think about it. I'll be really interested to hear your ideas and your arguments for what they need. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Take care.